Welcome back to the Free Code Camp podcast. I'm Quincy Larson, teacher and founder of FreeCodeCamp.org. Each week, we're bringing you insight from developers, founders, and ambitious people getting into tech. This week, we're joined by Jabril. Jabril is building a turn-based fighting game called Ultra Bouters. And he's developed a ton of games over the years, which he's featured on his very popular YouTube channel, all about game development. Got lots of links to cool stuff that he's built over the years that you can check out. But first, Jabril, how's it going, man? Quincy, thanks for having me, man. Thanks for the intro. Yeah. That was such a great intro. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just, I rehearsed when I, I told you earlier, I just rehearsed when I'm like walking back from dropping my kids off at school, like just kind of. Anyway, yeah. I'm thrilled to have you here, man, because like I've just enjoyed so much like uh, watching your video late. I always watch it late at night because it's so entertaining and you, I find you like laugh twice as hard at things uh -huh. when it's like a little bit after bedtime. Uh -huh. So uh, yeah, man, like I was just watching like, for example, the fake Shark Tank episode mm -hmm. <laughs> generator mm -hmm. tool that you yeah. created that, that creates uh, the scripts from like uh shark tank and, and like they're very absurd product ideas but like oh yeah you know it feels just like an actual shark tank episode in terms of the absurdity of the yeah. show which is if anybody spent a lot of time in business you know that the show is pretty divorced from reality in terms of how business deals actually go down but that's yeah. that's part of the fun of it right it's yeah. reality television which is really hyper real television yeah yeah, yeah. so anyway i'm sorry to like ramble right off the bat man but it's great to have you here yeah, it's great to be here, man. I'm excited to talk about all things code and development and game dev, and let's get into it. Awesome. And I just want to point out also, Jabril, uh, contributor to the Free Code Camp community. You can check out his five-hour introduction to programming course. It's very flavorful, and it's very different from like, kind of like the more straight-laced course that I would develop if I were creating a course. It's, you just have all these different kind of like visual gags and other things you do to like really engage and help people retain everything. So like, yeah, I'm going to link to that as well in the show notes. Be sure to check that out after you finish listening to this interview. Yeah. After. after. <laughs> yeah. And just a real quick, I want to thank the 8,452 people around the world who support free Coke camp each month. Thank you for supporting us with your donations. It's a huge help to our charity and it makes programming like this possible. So if, yeah. if you are not yet supporting free code camp, check out don't uh, free code camp.org slash donate. And you can start supporting us today. Tax exempt charity. You can deduct this from your taxes. And you know, our mission is very simple to create free learning resources for everyone. And one of those resources, of course, interviews with real life game devs who are in the field, building projects, getting players, play testing, refining, and continuing to extend their library of awesome interactive experiences for people. Interactive art, really. Um, so, yeah, uh, Jabril, I just want to go way back. I always like to start with childhood. Like, mm. tell us about little Jabril. Tell us yeah. about, like, your early formative years and how you got into game dev. Yeah. Let's go back. Uh, before I do that, I want to give a shout to you guys over at Free Code Camp. Love what you guys are doing. Keep it up. Um, so let's let's go back. I think it's it's probably best that I start with. Um, I was I think nine years old. I was living in Virginia at the time. My mm -hmm. father's in the military, so I, I've been around the coast of the United States, and I we played a lot of video games when I was growing up. Actually, I should take it back, back, back. When I was I think four, I think it was. My mom used to play a lot of video games on the Super Nintendo. Mm. And she used to play uh, Donkey Kong Country. And I would watch her play this game. And I was just so amazed because she had a control in her hand, right? And she's controlling Donkey Kong. But there's other agents on screen. And as a young kid, I'm like, who, who's controlling the agents? Who's controlling the other ones, right? And so I've always had a fascination. But it wasn't until I was about nine years old when I was introduced to the first Smash Bros. on Nintendo 64. And I don't know what it is about that project, that game. It just, like got my game development bug like just running and yeah. i will never forget we moved from virginia to california and i had a notepad and the entire time i'm just like designing levels that i would do if i was the developer for smash bros um and then fast forward to i think it was like i was 14 and i got an advertisement for this thing called game maker it's like you can mm -hmm. code you can code you can make games without coding was the ad. And I was like, no way, mom, can you buy this for me? 
And she was like, well, if you do your chores for a week straight, I'll buy it for you. You're dang right. I did my chores for a week straight. She bought it for me. And that was the last time I got a full night's sleep. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you pretty early on, you were like, I love games. I'll, I'll tell you a little anecdote about Smash Brothers. When it came out, like, of course, I was like a big N64. Like, like I had an N64. I actually had four controllers because I loved couch wow. co-op games, as, as they're called now. You call it couch co-op because you're actually playing in the room with other people, unlike most, you know, online games today. Uh, and I remember, like, that was such a game changer. It was so imaginative. I just, I couldn't believe the absurdity. Like, wow, I can actually go up as Donkey Kong and punch Mario in yeah. the face. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. and knock him off the level, and even like the the actual intro and stuff, kind of like like the final boss is like hands, and it, it really evokes kind of like a childlike play. Like yeah. you're, you're actually like you'd pick up your action figures as a kid, and you'd have He Man and Skeletor fist fight and stuff, like twisting him around and stuff, and and that kind of it has that that vibe of like I'm just a kid who's hanging out on a summer day and playing with my action figures. Yeah, such a cool game. Yeah, yeah, and it's, of course, it's an amazing game huge competitive uh scene around that game too which i never would have imagined like people getting so good at it they dedicate like years to getting really good at playing princess peach in smash yeah. brothers melee like a specific character in a specific game but it's a yeah. legendary game you know it's a legendary game yeah so uh, okay so you get game maker your yes. your mom gets it for you after being a really good kid for a week <laughs> uh, i don't know about all of that but uh <laughs> i did my chores <laughs> well, what what were, what were the first few days like uh when you had game maker like what were the first things you experimented with okay man so I, it was game maker 5 and they had a bunch of examples i'll never forget it it was like a i forget what the actual game is but it was like a plane game 2d plane game and it was like an example project and then they showed you how to like shoot bullets how to control the plane move left and right how to spawn enemies and i just spent so many hours trying to understand like what every little component was doing and all the examples that they had i think they had just converted over to marketing game maker as a something you can make games without coding so like a drag and drop system like really early days and i did the best i could to understood like the logic that was going on and then i made my first project which was like a, a pong remix if you will uh, i can send you an image of that i still have images of it yeah and it it was terrible. It was an absolutely terrible game. Uh, I did not understand physics, but I did the best I could. Uh, but I shipped it, so that's that's pretty important. And then I just kept on. I, and then I learned about the forums. I learned about the Game Maker forums, which was like so important to my learning on how to use Game Maker. Because all of a sudden, I had this resource to all these people that have been doing it for years, and I can ask them questions. They would answer it, and yeah, yeah. So getting hooked up with other game developers, like, did you find that that like was a huge motivational shot in the arm in terms of like, I'm actually showing off to people that I'm interacting with. Did you feel like you found your so-called, you, you know, your tribe, so to speak? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And I think one thing that's easy to miss from back in the days is that distribution of games was not, it was not a thing. Like you were making games for yourself and maybe 10 other people in a forum thread that's about it so back then like you had to do it for the love of it and i think that having discovered the forum it really helped keep that love alive you know yeah i mean did you build any games that you just like kept to yourself like this is my game like i just want to like i'm the only person who's ever played this this game kind of like uh, a lot of musicians they'll like hoard like their best work just for themselves to enjoy there were a few projects where that was the case, but I, I wouldn't say I put like all my time and energy into it. Um, the ones where I put a lot of time and energy, I wanted as many people to play as possible. But again, back in those days, like you're talking 20 downloads. It's like, oh my God, yes, I can't believe this. Yeah. But there, yeah. there was one project in, in particular, I'll never forget that I made with my brother and sister. And it was, you, you had to like race to the helicopter. It was like mm -hmm. a three player game. We had to split the keyboard into three different controls. To, like it was wasp arrows and something else. And we just shared a keyboard, but it was so fun to, you know, be able to put our imagination, you know, into an app. It, it was a good time. Do you play with, you said wasp W A S D just for anybody who hasn't gamed recently. Mm -hmm. Like that's, those are the keys that I guess customarily, uh, people playing like counter-strike and stuff will use, 
but I actually use ESDF because it gives my pinky like access to more buttons mm. for like switching weapons and stuff. So, and I, I know, uh, I learned about this from Gabe Newell, founder of steam, uh, or, or of, uh, valve. Uh, now the steam company, <laughs> instead of making games, they just have a game platform. They, they yeah. do occasionally put out games, but, um, but yeah, he, he's like a ESDF player <laughs> instead of a WASD player. How, how do you, what do you have any particular, since we're on the topic, like, do you have any particular like control scheme quirks that you think are unique to you? Uh, I don't, think so honestly these days i if it's not a gamepad i don't know if i can play it (laughs) okay so so even like for pc games and stuff you like plug a playstation controller in or something like that i'm a i'm a huge gamepad buff i have so many gamepads like weird ones and all types of unique ones so yeah i have a bunch of ones that will fit the best need for whatever the game is if they support it of course awesome yeah, do you ever get like like the steering wheel type game, like or like the flight stick? Do you do any games like that? I wish that I had time to invest in stuff like that. I my dad had one when I was younger, and it was pretty fun. But nowadays, I, I don't have like an hour block to just dedicate yeah. to that. Unfortunately, so it's I not worth you. the investment. Well, you're you're focused on getting things done and making games, not just playing games, right? Uh-huh. So, um, so before we get into like full blown game development, I do want to learn a little bit more. Like, so you went from the forums. Was there like a particular like APOC in game development where you're just focusing on that very small audience of people on the same thread on a forum? Like, hey, I've been working on this game. Here's the latest build, you know, stuff like yeah. that. It, was, there, was there a transition period where you started making games for like a broader audience? And do you remember what that inflection point was? Um, hmm. That's a great question. Honestly, I don't think that really happened until I started the YouTube channel. Yeah. Now, there was like a, a rudimentary form of that. So on the forums, I, I don't know how many active people there were. I, I'd say probably 100 people were active, you know, a given month, any given month. And if when you got good enough in the community, you could have a, a thread post that you would update, like how your game is doing and people would chime in, they would play it and give you feedback. But it required a certain level of skill. And I remember I hit that I hit that threshold for like one or two of my projects. But by that time, I was, you know, transitioning out of Game Maker and getting into, like, you know, high school sports and going yeah. to college prep and all that stuff, you know. So so a lot of people's passions are derailed by high school and, like, the kind of high school metagame, so to speak. Like, oh, I've got to be were – you, were you, like, a popular kid at school? Or, like, how would you describe your high school experience? I wouldn't say I was – popular in the sense that like a lot of people correlate like the popular kid to i got along with everyone so i i guess i was popular in that sense but no i wasn't i definitely wasn't the popular kid and and it's interesting the school that i went to i i was definitely in the closet about making games i didn't tell anyone just due to the school that i went to like no one cared about it and it was kind of nerdy if you will back then so i wasn't trying to get stuffed in the locker (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Have you like, so this is just like an observation. Like I I saw this interesting video essay, you know, I watched a lot of video essays on YouTube. uh, And it was about like how like nerdy and geeky and like these terms have kind of like almost fallen out of use because like everybody's a Star Wars fan now or, uh, you know, uh, you know, a Lord of the Rings fan or something like that. There's not really a stigma associated Mm. with using computers (laughs) like there used to be. I I mean, have you observed that? Like, was yeah, I mean, yeah. do you ever feel like what you're doing is quote unquote nerdy anymore when you're like, you know, making these very, you know, artisanal games that are very esoteric and like probably a very small subset of gamers, let alone people at large would be interested in playing these games? Yeah, the so nerds are definitely in vogue now. And I think about this quite often. It's hard to unpair my experiences as a nerd, as a kid, right, from, you know, the, the man that I am today. But uh, it's so, I think it's so beautiful that there are so many people that I can reach out to and have conversations about code, about game development, about apps. Because I remember when I was starting out, it was nearly impossible to find anyone to talk about this stuff with. Like, I was lucky that my mom had a friend that knew someone that had a software development job. And when I asked him for advice, he just gave me Visual Studio 2004 or something like that. He just gave it to me. And it was like, good luck. Yeah. Like, that was all I had. And I remember trying, I tried to install it and I was like, I have no idea what this is. And I just never touched it again. 
Um, but yeah, I think it's so beautiful that, you know, nowadays you can talk to literally anyone about code and they'll have some idea. And I think it's just due to the prevalence of how important, you know, you know code is and how prevalent it is in our society nowadays. Yeah, 100%. Like, I've definitely found that, like, when I'm at a dinner party or something, uh, it used to be, like, even 10 years ago, I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm a software developer. And people would be like, oh, okay, cool. And the conversation would just move in, move on. But now people are like, oh, cool. Like, um, I'm working on this app, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, like, uh, I've been yeah. doing some Python on the weekend and stuff like that. And, like, suddenly, yeah. like, yeah. it just seems like the number of people who are interested in learning programming has skyrocketed. And that any like uh, there, there's kind of like there used to be that like, oh, that's for smart people type talk. But I don't really hear that anymore when mm -hmm. I talk to people. It could be that just like the crowd I'm rolling with is a little older now um, because I'm older. <laughs> so like sure. when I go talk to people, they're often in their 30s and 40s like I am, you know, uh, as opposed to like younger kids. When I was a kid, like people were like not very sure of themselves and they would often like limit themselves. But you know, as you grow older, you start to realize, oh, like, these limits are artificial. You know, like there's nothing stopping an accountant from getting really good at coding, right? Um, yeah. I mean, did you? I think you it's more than that, that, though. Okay, well, yeah. I, I I think it's a bit more than that. I think that you know, just relating to my experiences when I was a kid, the accessibility to these things were so hard to get to, right? But we have things like. Free Code Camp, for example, right? Where if I want to learn something, I just go to Free Code Camp and you guys have all these resources for me to learn how to do these things, right? And this is something that we have to thank the modern era for, yeah. you know? Uh, you, you know, you take Game Maker, for example. I'm so happy that they decided to do a drag and drop system because without that, I don't know if I would have... I don't know how long it would have took me to discover code, you know? But that was a good entry point for me to say, like, hey, this looks like something I can do. You know, you're, you're telling me I don't need to code. But little did I know it was a stepping stone to the actual code because there's limits to what you can right. do with the drag and drop. But the point I'm trying to make is that I think just things have got a lot more accessible in the modern age. And it has really enabled so many people to be able to learn to code or just simply know more about what it takes to code or be a coder, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I'm really interested in like understanding kind of the tools that your tool progression, because you said that uh, you had like some, some friend who gave you visual studios, which is a gigantic, very complicated <laughs> piece of software, right? Like that's at, like at an 15, industrial. At yeah. 15. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, that's like giving somebody the master sword right when they walk into the cave right. instead of like, right. you know, stair stepping them up through like some through sort it. of like leveling progression. Right. Uh, so, so what, what did you do? You're like, you put that down. Did you just go back to Game Maker? Or like, what, what tools did you get into? Do you remember the sequence of tools yeah. you progressed through? Well, funny enough, the, the, I got Visual Studio before I even knew Game Maker existed. So I knew that I wanted to make games, but I didn't know how. It, it, like, I cannot explain how my understanding of making games was, like, how, how difficult it was for me to, to grasp the concept of making a game how do you use a computer to render graphics to render logic etc i i can't explain to you like how difficult trying to imagine that was um and so yeah the first i asked my mom that she had the friend he gave me visual studio I was like here you go this is how you code good luck that was all he gave me <laughs> i Linux tried approach. to install it yeah i tried to install it didn't work thankfully like a year or two later i discovered game maker uh, and then I did Game Maker for like four years, I think it was, something like that. And then I found Unity soon after yeah. that. And tell us about Unity. Just like for people that are uninitiated, like why is Unity different from, you know, like an SDK for developing on like PlayStation or something like that, right? Yeah. Unity, it just provides so many things for you. It makes like developing games so easy. Uh, they do graphics for you. They do physics for you. They do... Um, different like pathfinding logic they do so many things for you right out the box that you don't have to think about the hard stuff you can just get started making some type of game and then in the process of making your game using their their out of the box tools you learn how to like use those tools more pro efficiently over time and that was really instrumental for me i i'll never forget when i first started unity that using unity was the first time i ever made a 3d game it was always my goal to make 3d games but Having done 2D for so long, I thought it was like such an impossible task. But in the first, I think, week of using Unity, 
so much of what I learned with Game Maker, not to mention Game Maker has their own coding language as well. So that was another thing that was like, oh, I'm not a real coder. I'm using Game I'm Maker using language. Like, yeah, exactly. It's like, I'm not really coding. I'm using Scratch yeah. or I'm using some simplified for, but it really is still coding. Yeah. I think people kind of like talk themselves out of like, you know, acknowledging what their, their accomplishments they they yeah. uh, kind of like denigrate their accomplishments. Oh, I'm just using the training wheels equivalent, but it's still coding, right? Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. And so I'm using Game Maker language, and I'm like, I'm not a real coder because I'm using their little subset language, right? But then I start to uh, develop games in Unity. I was like, why not, right? And then I was like, wait a second, this is C sharp. This is this is a this is a big boy language. I know what a for loop is. I know what an if statement is. I know what a while loop is. Like, hold on, I know all these concepts, and like, it was so easy to transfer from game maker language to c-sharp and then from there c-sharp to python and then yeah it as long as you learn the basics i don't no matter what the language is like coding is so easy to transfer the skills over yeah absolutely like at the at the end of the day it's like the same basic like data structure and algorithm concepts that yeah. have been around since alan turing right yeah. uh, maybe maybe like a few were refined by subsequent generations of computer scientists and then you're just applying math that has been known all the way back to like al khwarizmi back in like yeah. you know, the ancient uh you know indian civilizations and babylonian civilizations and stuff right like there's nothing new under the sun <laughs> except yeah. layers of extraction that make it easier and will continue to make it gradually easier and easier and and we'll definitely talk about that in a little bit but I, what were you doing now you can make a 3d game right it's yeah. not some pipe dream it's something you actually did within the first week of using these tools. Yeah. Like what was that like a honeymoon phase for you? Were you like walking on air knowing like, wow, I'm actually doing it. <laughs> yeah. I was incredibly proud. I, I believe the first 3d game I made was a game jam. Uh, it's still up somewhere. It's called super haystack finder. Super or something haystack like that. finder. So something like finding like a needle in a haystack or something like that. That's, yeah. That's the concept. So you're jumping platform to platform. You're looking for a little, uh, a cookie for some reason. Um, so that was the first project I did. And I was like, there's no way, like, this was so easy. You just add one extra dimension and it's not that difficult. And then from there, I made my first app that I launched on the Google play store. It's called pizza jump it's still up to this day. And I was so proud of that game. I was so proud. Uh, and then from there, like the sky was the limit. I was unlocked. I was unleashed. Like I, 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 I will, I never will forget that. After that project, that was when I realized that, like, there are no limits. I can do anything. I can do anything. And then from there, I got into Python, which I want to say really quick. I, there's one piece of advice that I have for anyone who, especially, like, starting to develop, no matter what language it is. Be very careful listening to some people who try to give you advice on, like, what language is good or bad or not. Because there are so many people that are telling me that... Python is not a, a useful language and it's it's yeah. for beginners and it's not a good language. But Python is so powerful. Like when I started to code in Python and how simple it was to do certain concepts comparative to, to C sharp, I was like, what are you guys talking about? This thing is amazing. And then obviously it got all this support and you can do AI and artificial intelligence, yeah. machine learning in it. But yeah. Yeah. There are just so many lessons that are coming to me at, at such a short period of time that I'll never forget. So it's almost like uh, like a lot of the kind of mythos around game development is melting away and you're seeing like the actual day-to-day -day of game development, the practical considerations. How do I get distribution for my game? How do I um, come up with interesting ideas that are going to be fun? How can I recombine these different game development concepts and tropes that have been pioneered through like the 70s 80s 90s like how can i recombine those into interesting games right mm -hmm. I, I don't mean to be putting too many words in your mouth but that's i imagine you're probably going through something like that as a kid who's just built their first game using unity yeah and and so where do you go from there like so you're in high school you're building games like do you show your friends you said that you didn't uh, that you kind of kept your game development to yourself because nobody was interested in that stuff. They're probably interested in, you know, typical high school stuff like football and getting a car and other stuff. Like you grew up in California, right? Like you yeah. said you moved for what uh, area of California were you in? I live in San Diego. I okay. went to a very, very urban school. So yeah, they, a lot of the kids there, they're used to playing like the Call of Duties and 
Need for Speed and all the, you know, the the AAA games. And I'll never forget, I showed my friend, I had this really uh, rudimentary but cool drifting game, like like drift car racing. drifting game. Yeah, drift racing game that I showed my friend. And it was like gray box and whatnot, but... And he just laughed at me. He's like, what is this? Like, why would I ever play this? You know? Damn. And, and <laughs> I mean, listen, I understand where he's coming from. You know, why would he waste his time playing that when there's like need for speed, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll never forget that experience. I was like, yeah, I'll just keep this in my little forum, friends. <laughs> that sucks, man. That's that's so discouraging. But like, like, let's talk about kind of opening up and blossoming of okay. Super Bowl. As, as you kind of like, so you're going to have lots of encounters like that. Just like, like. I had similar encounters with my writing. Like I'd write like a short story. I'd show it to somebody. They'd be like, oh man, this is, why would I read this when I can go read, you know, sure. like, you know, best-selling book by somebody, right? That You get it like the supermarket or whatever. You know, like how did you kind of, did you ever stop doing game development at any point? I did. I did. I had a, I think it was like a four-year gap of, I didn't really touch code at all. Wow. Um, yeah, it was so. The story goes: at fifteen, I get introduced to Game Maker Five, and then I'm making games, really passionate about it. But then I think I, I turned like a junior in high school, and all of a sudden, like you know, I'm interested in girls and yeah. being cool and going to parties and stuff, right? And so that's where I start to invest a lot of my time, and I just like stop touching code. Um, but I pick it back up at I think like twenty three or something like that so from 19 to like 23 four years something like that 23 24 um is when i pick it back up again because you know if you have a passion for something like no matter what it's always gonna poke you so like, hey, was hey, it like calling me. to you from the bookshelf like you just walk by your old uh unity books back in the day we'd like buy actual game like books like yeah. these big thick books someone would come with cd roms and stuff i don't know if that may have been before your time because you're a little bit younger than me but like <laughs> Did you ever like look at your old things like, huh? Like kind of like heave like your chest a little, huh? Like uh, like Toy Story when he kind of like gets tired of the toys and uh, maybe Toy Story 10, Toy Story 11, he actually becomes like Tom Hanks character from Big where he's like working at an exec, you know, <laughs> as like a toy yeah. tester at some big toy company or something like that. You know, like yeah. like pining back for the, for the toys. Did you ever feel that kind of like that you were, to trying to yeah. deny a part of yourself that society yeah. is like causing you to like Delerick be Delerick from that childhood ambition. Yeah. I think in hindsight, I definitely agree with that. Uh, obviously in the moment I, I didn't have any awareness of this, but yeah, I think it hit a point where I realized that all these things that I was chasing externally didn't really matter. You know, like when the friends dried up and the party stopped, you know, calling me to come over all you're left with is these memories that you have as a kid, you know, spending 16 hours a day developing this game that 10 people are going to look at, you know? Yeah. And yeah, it was calling me back. I was like, Hey, look, I, you know, really enjoyed those times and I want to have memories like that again. So I picked up game maker again, started making some games again. And then it hit a point where I wanted to 3d. And so unity was that option. Yeah. So like once you hit the ground running with unity, like, like maybe you can just, Take us, give us a quick tour of the next few years of your life. Like, what what mm -hmm. were you doing? Did you have the equivalent of like, you know, Kanye staying at home an entire summer making beats? <laughs> you know, like where, where it was like a renaissance <laughs> of creativity, or like what happened? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I yes, one hundred percent. That that was me from fifteen to like eighteen. Like every single summer from that point on, I was like, nope, don't want to go to parties. Nope, don't want to do anything. I'm just gonna sit here and code games. Um. But in terms of, so I, I, I got to Unity, I think around like 23, 24, and then I'm making games in Unity, and I'm watching all these different tutorials and whatnot, and I'm also making YouTube videos. Not, I'm not making the YouTube videos I'm making today, I'm making like documentary style yeah. YouTube videos. But then I realized that like, there's a lot of people that have tutorials on how to like make these games and whatnot, right? But there weren't a lot of channels of people making stuff from what they learn from the tutorials yeah and i was like i'm gonna do that that sounds okay. like fun you know so you kind of found a new lane uh and, and like i have lots of friends who do this genre of 
YouTube video where they're like, I built this game like, 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 or they speed up the development and it's like just lightning fast. Like here, now we got the character jumping and not like slumping over and stuff like that. Right. So mm. like I, to some extent, I think you inspired or helped inspire a lot of people who now do that kind of uh, game development and like actually apply the skills that they learned from tutorials on like free code camp and places like that. Right. Can you talk about like an early video that you created? And at what point did you start uploading videos to YouTube? It was like maybe like eight or eight or nine years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other branch, but yeah, I've, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've been oh, okay, for so a really long time. before we get to that, you had been building games. Like, yeah. I, I'm just trying to bridge the past with the present. Like, yeah. at what point did you start? Like, like, did you? Why did you even approach YouTube? Did you? Were you like, this can help me raise awareness of my games, or I just I have time. I'm just going to create some videos for myself and my friends. What was your philosophy? I, I've done a lot of things, all right? I've done a lot of things. I'm going to make it really brief because that's a whole other branch of the story. Yeah. But to make it short and to correlate it to the coding stuff, when I was in high school, me and some buddies got together and decided to make a, a YouTube channel. Okay. We didn't have any skills. We didn't really know anything, so we made a prank channel, okay? It was just the thing to do back then. And that taught me a lot about uh, how to build audiences, how lucrative it can be to create internet content and so that bug that that bug was like the the foundation for me to later create the channel that i have today but so long story short it hit a point where the pranks where youtube demonetized all pranks across the platform it was okay this this jig is up right yeah however i knew that there was still a lot of value in speaking to an audience and you know giving them entertainment and value and so I made a documentary channel where I would just document various things that was happening. All the while in the background, I come home and I'm coding like hours and hours and hours at night. But it didn't dawn on me to share what I was doing. It was, this is past the Game Maker Forum, so I didn't really have anyone to share it with. Yeah. It was just kind of like a me thing that I did for myself, you know, as a, as a meditation, if you will. But yeah, one day it hit me that I spent, I was spending so many hours developing games and apps, so many hours watching tutorials. And what I wanted was more content on YouTube of people demonstrating their learnings from these, this content. And at the time there was maybe one person that was doing it. And so I decided to, to completely rebrand my channel to Jabril's. Uh, we're doing coding now. And I think like the, fourth video blew up i did a ai machine learning project in unity and uh good times good times <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um first of all why is there an s at the end of your name jabril's is it like jabril's channel or <laughs> is that why i i love this question um <laughs> you're gonna be a little disappointed the answer is just because i find it funny <laughs> <That's> it. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times like I've I've been in rooms with execs and they call me Jabril's plural and it's just so fu it's just funny I don't know it's, if I call it's you like Quincy's, a test of whether people actually know who you are like uh, no because we joke like um, so I, I have a friend uh, and what she does is like she puts like an emoji like a ramen emoji or something at the front of her LinkedIn name. That way, mm. when like recruiters or some automated message sends it, it always she can always see the ramen emoji at the beginning of her name, Smart. and she knows, Smart. oh, this isn't a real person who knows me. This is just like some bulk, like Smart. email or something like that. Yeah. So smart. So, yeah, so unfortunately, no. I just find it funny when people refer to me as a plural. It, it's just funny. <laughs> it's just, like if I call you Quincy's, as you're multiple people, it's just funny. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, that'd be like the Quincy's from Bleach. Everybody's telling me, I haven't seen Bleach, but everybody's like, oh yeah, the Quincy's. Like people occasionally, every once in a while, you get this email, I won't let you take my Bankai. <laughs> and I'm like, what's a Bankai? You know, but apparently there's like this race of like angels or something like that in, in this show Bleach. And they're the, the most powerful because they can take away like the Bleach character's like weapon, the Bankai. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> but, but like, yeah. yeah the, so you have this YouTube channel. The fourth video blows up. Of course, like this happens to a lot of people. Like Free Code Camp, we published a, uh, uh, you know, some videos that really blew up. Like after like I think like three or four years, and we're like, oh, should we chase this success? Like maybe we should lean into this like lane that we found. And it's it's hard to reproduce that lightning in the bottle. Yeah. What, yep. what was your like after that fourth video? What happened? I did not learn 
my lesson, <laughs> unfortunately. It took me a while to learn my lesson. What I mean by that is, so this video blows up and it reaches a large audience, an audience I've never seen before. And in hindsight, I realized like what I should have done was really capitalize on the audience, give them more of what they wanted. But instead, I continued to make content that, you know, was just really for me. And the views didn't really match that. But I, it, I think it was a really important part to, to my journey. But it did give me a greater audience than what I had previously. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I, so maybe you could talk about that balance of like balancing your own interests rather than just becoming like YouTuber person who's the generically approachable, interesting person that like, you know, probably does well on YouTube. But, but I think to some extent the algorithm probably forces you in certain directions in terms of uh, being not yourself, but being who people want you to be, right? Like I imagine if you're like a late night TV show host, you have to shave off a lot of the edges and, and you know, like probably similar with YouTube. I, I mean, I don't know this because I've steadfastly refused to adopt like various conventions around, you know, video podcasting. Like I didn't even do video podcasting for a long time. And now that we're doing them, I'm doing them in like a, kind of a weird way, like no editing, uh, any of that stuff that is like unconventional, but it's how I want to do it. I want it to be yeah. real, right? Yeah. Like how yeah. did you balance? Like you probably saw the numbers like, Oh, people don't like the real Jabril as much as they like the Jabril from video number four. Do I have to like put myself in a, you know, freeze myself in time and just be that exact person for every video. If I want to get traction, like, did you go through that kind of like soul searching? It, it took me a while to, to understand that dichotomy of content. Uh, I'm I'm saying like probably a couple of years ago when I really understood this this dichotomy of content. Um, but at the time, you know, I was just happy to have any audience watch this uh, watch stuff that I was doing. Uh, but yeah, I, I it I think that it's not necessarily like what the algorithm is encouraging. I think it's more rooted in just human nature, right? Like you turn on any show and. You, you have some expectation as to what you're going to see, right? If you turn on America's Funniest Home Videos and all of a sudden they start showing like an, a hockey match, <laughs> and you're like, yeah. what, what is this? I'm never going to watch this again, right? And, you know, it's a lesson that I had to learn and it is really unfortunate. But on top of that, I think it's what has inspired me to do things like create a manga or create a game because that element of pleasing an audience really only affects you when you rely on it to pay your bills, right? I don't rely on the manga or the game that I'm making ultra goddess to, to pay my bills. Therefore I can be as free as I want in yeah. my expression with those projects. And you know, the, the, the goal with the YouTube channel is to hopefully get it to someday where I figure out a way to have that free expression while also paying my bills, but it's easier said than done. And I'm, I'm currently in that journey. So, yeah. So if you don't mind me asking, like, like how, how do you pay the bills? Like, uh, and, and maybe you can talk about how you paid the bills, like graduating from high school and just, you know, if you graduated and, and progressing in general, I say if you graduated, cause I, I didn't graduate. I dropped out as a <laughs> sophomore, but like a lot of people, uh, like they, they kind of have this listless period. Uh, d did you go to university? I went to junior college for okay. a couple of years and then dropped out. Okay. So <laughs> I, a lot I was of going for the wrong the degree. Yeah. What I was were you going studying? For the wrong degree. I was studying film and communication. No one okay. told me. All right. No one told me. Um, but we're sitting. We're literally sitting in class watching movies and like writing essays on movies. And I'm just like, what? What am I doing? <laughs> and so I, I was, I dropped out with the plan to return to do biology because I love biology so much. But I learned that my financial aid right now, and I was not down to go do a loan. So yeah. Well, I, uh, so you dodged yeah. the loan bullet. Uh, that, did. that's good. Like you did, you figured it out before you had taken on a whole lot of, you know, potentially restrictive debt that you'd have to pay off. Um, which the credit card, the, the credit card companies hate me for. They yeah. tell me I need different types of loans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, well, congratulations on that. So you, you've dropped out of junior college. What happens? What do you do? This is like, at some point you did create the YouTube channel, but like, or maybe you'd been doing the YouTube channel for a while, but like, how did you get from that Jabril that didn't really know what what to do to a person who, you know, has a pretty large, like half a million subscriber YouTube channel who's like a household name? 
among game uh-huh. developers who uh, has built kind. a lot of games and has a lot of games in the app store and just comes up with really cool projects that we're going to talk a little bit about later. Like seemingly like every few months you, you pop up and you're like, Hey, here's this crazy new thing that nobody's <laughs> ever done before. Like how did you, what, what was the transition period Yeah, between those two people? Yeah. So I, I've always had multiple things going on. Like it, it, since as early as I can remember, and at the time that I'm doing college, I'm also filming for the prank channel that I was talking about not too long ago. And so me and my buddies will get together on the weekend. We film the prank stuff. And that, it, it didn't pay any bills. Like, it was, you know, it paid gas for us to get around town. Every once in a while, we get, like, a sponsor deal, and we would split it. But I did that. At that time, I was, I was living off of financial aid. But after that ended, I got I started doing a bunch of odd jobs. So I worked at a comedy uh, club. Uh, what were you doing then? I was, I didn't have an official title. So it was a new comedy club that opened up in San Diego called American Comedy Co. And I just remember cold uh, emailing the owner because there's a bunch of articles on it. And I was like, hey, I will do anything. Please just let me help you out. He was like, yeah, sure. Come by. And then I came by and I never had an official title, but I helped out with marketing. I helped out with, um, you know, a little design and whatnot. Uh, that was a lot of fun, but that ended for me. And then I got into doing, uh, working at a radio station, uh, all the while, all the while I'm still making YouTube videos, trying to figure that part out. And then I worked at the radio station for about four years to pay the bills. And then, oh man, I, I don't know how deep you want to go into this. Yeah, I've let's done do it. a lot. Okay. Let's do it. Comedy club so, to a radio station. You've had an interesting life so far. Yeah. Okay. And so, so the radio station was the last job that I ever worked. And when I left the radio station, life got incredibly interesting and difficult at the same time. Man. Okay. I'm going to break it down. So <laughs> at, the, at the end of me working at the radio station, I had a friend that I knew that made prank videos that I met through making prank videos, right? His right. name is Garrett. And when His you, channel's called Overboard When you say Humor. prank video, just give us an idea of what a prank video, would this be like like MTV Punk or something like that? Or like, what what is it? What is a prank video? So I'm trying to think. My favorite prank video that we did. So like one video that I did is um, I did like a magic trick. So I had like a shirt that had a graphic on it. But it was like a it was like a magic trick shirt, right? So like I would go and ask people for directions. Say, hey, do you know where this thing is? And they would point me to directions. But then like I'd turn around and do a magic trick. The, the graphic would change, and I'd turn around. And it's a new t- uh, graphic, and they would just be like, "Wait, did your shirt change?" I'm like, oh, "What are you talking?" So I, it's stuff like that. You okay, know? so basically, it's kind of like uh, yeah, yeah. It's just like gaslighting people, <laughs> essentially. Just, that's one way to put it, Quincy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so, so I'm sorry. Uh, like, I just wanted to get an idea. <laughs> that sounds like yeah. a pretty cool. I didn't know there were like design changing. Sure, I won't ask the mechanics of that because I don't want to ruin it. If you know how what happens with the quarter when it's supposedly behind your ear, it makes yeah. it a lot less interesting, right? But um, maybe you can talk about that. Go back to that friend who is doing these videos with you. Yeah. So, so he had his own channel, and he had a lot of success from uh, doing YouTube pranks. Way more than I had, right? And we had reconnected when I was working at the radio station. And you said, hey, I need help filming. Are you willing to like, he lived in Orange County. I lived in mm-hmm. San Diego. It's about 100 miles, something like that apart. Yeah, both very nice places to live, by the way. Very, very nice places indeed. And so I agreed. I, I would go up to his house, I think on the weekends, and then stay for a few days, help him film, and then I would go back home. Uh, but it hit a point where I was filming with him so much. I had forgot that I had a shift at the radio station and they called me and they're like, Hey, you have a shift. I'm like, I am not in town. I cannot make it. And so like, they call me in they like, give me the talk and whatnot. They didn't fire me, thankfully. But I go back to my buddy and I'm telling about this, this, this dilemma, how fun it is to film with him and how annoying it is to go work at this radio station. He's like, you should just quit. You should quit. Come work with me. I'll pay you some money and it'll all be good. And like, I'm terrified, you know, content creation is very risky. And so eventually I say, okay, I'll do it. I quit. I go work with him a month later. We're no longer working together. What happened? I had, 
there's a lot of drama. There's a lot of drama. He was going through some stuff in his life. Um, but it's all public if you don't look it up. Okay. Uh, well, my homie Overboard Humor. Shouts to Garrett. Shouts to Garrett. Um, but long story short, so so after a month of working with him, I'm no longer working with him. I had maybe two thousand dollars in savings, and I'm like, what did I just do? And so the content creation is not really doing anything for me. Uh, I take up a lot of odd jobs, which is really difficult to do in San Diego, at least with the skill set that I had of like filmmaking and whatnot. And I, I will never forget, I gave up. I was like, I'm done. I'm done. Throwing in the towel. I'm just going to go work some job and figure out how to live a regular casual life. And so I take an interview at a store called Joanne's Fabric Stores. Uh, <laughs> so like literally like generic retail. Essentially, just 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 like give me I'm, I'm going to be like one of the characters from Clerks, basically. Just that, give me some money. Yeah, that that was my only priority, and I'll never forget. I walked in there, and the manager takes me into his room, really small, cramped room with boxes everywhere, and he's like, "Okay, so tell me a bit about yourself." I tell him, he's like, "Interesting. What what are your what are your dreams? What do you want to do?" And I was taken back by that question. I told him, I was like, you know, I really wish that I could, you know, build a YouTube channel and travel the world, et cetera, et cetera. And he closed this little book and he says, I'll never forget this. You don't belong here. I'm not going to hire you. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, all I'm going to do is use you to stock shelves, uh, stock books, uh, boxes on shelves. I just need someone tall. That's it. I'll be <laughs> wasting your talent. I, I kid you not. I kid you not. And so I walk out of there just like, what just happened? But that gave me the energy that I needed to really push as hard as possible on content creation. Wow. And so, Shout out to Joanne's Fabric Store, like the, the manager there, for setting yeah. you on that course. That's great. Yeah. I, I wish I would have went and got his name and shook his hand. But uh, I'll never yeah, if, forget that. If he that. can see you now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, that gave me the, all the energy I needed. I was so fired up after that. And I did a bunch of content creation. I, I spent maybe eight hours a day doing odd jobs or, or looking for odd jobs to enough where it would pay my bills. And then one day I came across this odd job from someone who's looking for help to film physics content, which happened to be Diana Cowern from Physics Girl. And yeah, so I was huge YouTube channel. Huge science huge YouTube learning, channel. science education channel. Yeah. And I responded to that did some editing for her she liked it and i've been with her editor for like three four years and very incredibly grateful shout out to diana uh, i uh can't wait for her to get better yeah absolutely yeah yeah so um so you're doing editing and is that like how did you transition into like building some of these games were you doing games at the same time Maybe just yes. give us a little bit more context into the timeline. So that's cool. So you've made the transition from radio, which is probably a job a lot of people who study communications and journalism uh, and things like that would be interested in going into. But, um, you know, you stop working in, in radio, and but now you're working in editing for mm -hmm. YouTube creators. And you're still creating your own stuff on the side, but you're paying the bills by working with, you know, a much more successful, like, name brand YouTube creator, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, I would pay the bills doing a bunch of jobs, but all the entire time I'm creating content, like it's not getting views. It's not making me money, but I'm creating content the entire time just because it was, it was a fun thing to do that I really enjoyed. And I always believed in its potential just to get the timeline synced. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And did you have other videos that started to get traction like that? Or like your fourth video? Did you, did you kind of like strike gold, so to speak, or, or like uh, kind of find that filament that like lights the bulb correctly <laughs> to use like a weird uh, Thomas Edison analogy? Like, were you able to like iterate toward a formula that worked that would, that also resonated with your passion as a creator? A little bit, a little bit. Again, in hindsight, I think that I, I probably should have been learning more lessons rapid, more rapidly than I did at the time. But I had did the first video of uh, making a machine learning game. It was like writing my first machine learning game, something like that. It went crazy viral. And then I just continued to upload videos like as I seen it. And then I struck gold again. I made another video called Making a Game in 48 Hours. Like this is before this was a trend. And that video also went really viral. But 
at the time, like, I was honestly just getting lucky, you know. I was learning, like, little lessons here and there. But it wasn't until I connected with a bunch of other content creators and they were able, we were able to, like, share lessons between each other where I really started to adapt, you know, optimal <laughs> strategies, if you will. Yeah, yeah. And, like, just looking at your most popular videos, uh, many of which I've watched, uh, you know, the Infinite Staircase is real. Nearly 8 million mm. views. My first learning, machine learning, like, about 2 million for that and also the 48 hour game jam mm -hmm. thing uh mm -hmm. minecraft but on a quantum computer <laughs> you know stuff like that <laughs> very cool so yeah. uh a lot of your videos have connected with the audience and like i guess way beyond your audience have, have had like mainstream appeal over the years can you talk about like what that's like in terms of uh does when you have a video that goes viral like your infinite staircase video did uh i mean 8 million views for like a sciencey topic this is not like some you know you're you're not like a hot woman or something like that right like you're sure. you're just a guy who's developing interesting stuff he's like building stuff and showcasing what he's building um can you talk about like the the audience and the experience of having that video blow up i think i've had like a, a tweet go viral with the bts uh -huh. army <laughs> and that's like my 15 <laughs> minutes of fame is like I, I i tweeted something about like bts just not even realizing what i was tweeting and like all these people jumped on me and that i guess that got like 15 million retweets or something like that but that's like the closest i've ever gotten to famous so to speak but d did you feel famous did things did it feel different to have a video getting all these views and people commenting and talking about it and sharing it uh i think unfortunately the sad part about consecration is you normalize it after a while and the any everything on the Jabril's channel comes after like some pre fame that yeah. I've experienced. So I did a prank with some buddies a long time ago, where we <laughs> we would. <laughs> I don't know if this is bad or not, but it was what it was. Okay. okay, we went up to people and we asked them if they wanted a little pot. Okay, right? like pot and they're the, like the marijuana. We asked them if they wanted a little pot, right? A little pot. They'd be okay. like, they'd be like, no, get away from me, freak! What the hell? And then we would pull out a literal little pot, like a literal little pot, a cooking <laughs> pot. And that video went crazy viral back in the days. And I had so many people reach out to me. I was on TV. Uh, someone offered to buy me a meal. Like it was, it was crazy. <laughs> that was the first time it actually felt crazy. Um, but everything after that, I think I kind of normalized the experience a bit. So you're just kind of like, you're the equivalent of that kid, like at the computer and the meme, they're like, yeah, thumbs up. It worked, you know, but then <laughs> yeah. you kind of move on if with the, the content grind. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and do you view it as a, a grind or like, how, how do you approach creating these videos about, you know, programming computer science and, and demonstrating different projects you're building? Yeah, I don't ever do it for any of the fame or any things like that. Like I do it genuinely because I love the ideas and I, I love being able to explore new concepts that probably someone hasn't really explored, at least in the manner that, that I want to explore it. And so my approach is always, how can I present something to you that you probably don't think about that often or probably haven't seen before in an entertaining manner? Uh, that often when those two meet is often when my videos do the best. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about game dev in general, because game dev has changed a lot since you got into it. Obviously like game maker, like there was a game called like hotline Miami that did they use game maker for that? They use like some really rudimentary, like early tool to develop. I believe it. they did. Yeah. And that's, I believe they used game maker. that was a cool game because it felt like you wouldn't know that they'd use such simple tools to create, such an elaborate game with like its own kind of physics engine and everything like that. But like there was that whole flash game era that mm -hmm. you developed flash games. Cause newgrounds.com was huge when I was a kid or when I was a teenager, like people would like develop these games. That you could play right in your browser and it just took accessibility to a new level. Yeah. Cause you just click on it. It loads and you play it. You don't have to download stuff. You don't have to like buy a physical media that you put into a console or anything like that. Yeah. I definitely played more Flash games than I made. Uh, I might be mistaken on the timeline, but I think by the time I was able to, you know, grasp logic and coding, it was kind of past its prime. Mm -hmm. I may have the timeline incorrect here, but I definitely yeah. remember when I was 
younger playing Flash games. This was like before Smash Bros. and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, and but I do remember trying. I made like one Flash game, and I just remember it being really annoying. The UI interface in in Adobe. What was that? Adobe what Flash? was it? Adobe? I don't know. Yeah, Adobe Flash. Yeah, Adobe Flash. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They renamed it, so my brain was, was oh, yeah. yeah. Adobe Flash. The, the UI was really annoying, in my personal opinion, and I had already had Game Maker experience, so I just preferred yeah. Game Maker. But yeah, well, um, maybe you can talk about like the game development meta, so to speak. Like, like who is working on games? Like, are are is it mostly hobbyists? Are there like hardcore game devs out there that like? Like, how would you describe the typical game developer in terms of like how they're approaching getting games done? I saw the the documentary indie ga- indie dev, uh, indie game, indie game. Yeah, that was yeah. pretty good. But I've heard like mixed things from actual game developers about like how representative it is of the typical game devs experience and things like that. And obviously, all three of those games were pretty popular, successful indie yeah. games. So, so it's already kind of like. Uh, show like a little bit of selection bias, survivorship bias, I guess. Uh, I, I imagine like most projects, most don't go anywhere, right? They probably don't even yeah. get completed. It's rare that people even finish projects that they start, right? But like maybe you could talk about like what your, how would you describe like a typical game developer's lifestyle and where they hang out, like whether that's Discord, whether that's um, like local kind of game developer, hacker space type places, Maybe you could just give me an idea of, you know, the the devs that you've come across and you've worked alongside it, and maybe give us a little more context in your process. Um, do you mind refining the question a bit? Yeah, more? absolutely. That was like fifteen questions in one. <laughs> what do game devs do <laughs> day to day? What's a typical day in the life of a game dev? Yeah, so I think like most things, there's a lot of variation. Right. And as game development has gotten more and more accessible, I think the variation has only increased. So, like, I know people that are, they ha- like, game development is their full time job, right? They've released some games to some audiences that love to play their games. They charge them for it and they can pay the bills that way, right? I know game developers that, you know, they're habitually making a game, canceling it, making a game, canceling it, making a game, cancel it, right? I know game developers that are always looking for funding. Right. They are going up to investors saying, like, hey, I have this idea. Will you please give me money to make it? Right. And I know game developers that just do the YouTube thing. Right. So there's a lot of variation. Um, but I will say thank you. I will say that I think the, the commonality between them all is that a lot of them have like a, a lot of passion for making games and, and telling stories and, uh, you know, trying to present something cool and creative to yeah. an audience. Yeah. What, what are some. I think the most important thing if you are trying to be a game developer that can actually ship games is scope. You have to learn scope. Uh, I think that's top of the funnel. Next up is passion. Focus on games that you you yourself want to play. And then after that, I would say is audience. Try and make games for existing audiences. Um, I think if you pair all those three things together, you will have a lot of games under your belt. Which, which, and, and I want to emphasize how important it is to actually ship games. I think it's fun to like habitually explore new concepts and whatnot, but shipping games is what you get critiqued on. You don't get, get critiqued on, you know, how well you can implement a pathfinding algorithm. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes total sense. So just uh, to recap, scope, passion for what you're building and having an existing audience, not having to like, Forge out in the wild for people that are interested in your completely novel game. Um, but c- yeah. can you describe scope? Like, and maybe how you scope things and, and where scope creeps. Maybe just start by defining scope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, so scope is the hardest one because it does require some like prior knowledge on whatever you're building, right? Like, so if I'm building a game that requires pathfinding, I have to have some knowledge on like the domain of pathfinding to be able to scope it. Um, and pathfinding but it's not, is like, like having an AI kind of like go around in certain paths. Is it that literally it? Like just programming NPCs correct. and stuff. Yeah. Non-player a, characters. A to B. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so yeah, scope is the hardest because again, you need 
you need to so, uh, you need to have some understanding of the domain of whatever you're implementing. But it's not impossible to get that information, right? There's so many resources everywhere, you know, especially in 2024. But yeah, so can you give me an example of a time that you like maybe made scope too broad? And scope is like like just basically focusing on a few key game elements or focusing on like what the goals of the project are. You know, it's easy to think like, oh, I'm going to create an open world game and it's going to have X, Y, Z. And like, you know, you look at like right. Cyberpunk uh, 2077. I can't remember the exact year. Correct. But like yeah, that is a game that had so much scope creep that it ruined the game. If they just not made it open world or if they'd not tried to add all these different attributes and stuff, like they they, they got too big for their britches, right? They, they leaned out farther than they, they should have in, mm. in terms of, you know, the scope. And right. yeah, and scope can prevent a project from ever getting done because the, the scope can keep expanding as an excuse to not actually ship like as a procrastination, you know, excuse, right? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. So, so has there been an instance that you can recall where you're like, you, you're like, you know, I think I've, I've gone outside of my original scope or I, I've, I've made some sort of error when it comes to scope and I need to correct it. It's a problem that I used to have a lot, but developing for a YouTube channel, it teaches you scope really quickly. <laughs> because you have a you reg know? regular schedule of releases? Like, I've only got Correct. two months to build this game. Or, like, what's your release schedule? Do you have a fixed schedule? Yeah. every I have to upload one video within 30 days of the last video. That's what I operate off of. Okay. It can be seven days. It can be 12 days. But it, I can't go more than 30 days. Okay. That's a great rule. To live by so that guides like for example i have to publish a podcast every friday i have to send out an email newsletter every friday right like so like those things force me to be accountable to myself and the yeah. rules i put in place yeah. so i love how you have that very simple rule it, you know i can create videos as frequently as i want but it doesn't matter how many i've published i still need to have one within 30 days of the last one yeah yeah that's yep. really cool it's like like uh yeah so so, so to do, come full circle, so like that that process, it really has taught me a lot about scope, right? Because it's it's one thing to be like, I want to make this game where I have all my subscribers connect to a server and they can walk around the world and drive cars. Like that's one thing, right? But then just having done this for so long, I can have a good idea on like, okay, how long is it going to take me? How many hours am I to invest in? If I start this video project in January, am I going to finish it in, in March or is it going to take me February of next year? You know, and it's something, it's a skill that you have to hone. I'm not going to sit here and say that it's easy, but it's definitely something that I encourage everyone to pay attention to and try and hone, you know? Yeah. So one of the things I want to ask is for people that are listening and they're interested in going into game development, maybe they have some basic programming chops. Maybe they've completed CS 50 or they've gone, they've earned a few free code camp certifications. They have a basic understanding of, you know, maybe Python, JavaScript. Uh, maybe they haven't worked with unity yet, but you know, it sounds like that's a tool you would encourage people to pick up. Um, mm -hmm. So let's say hypothetically um, they want to be a game dev, two years from now, they want to have a game live or do they okay. even need two years? Like, like what would you do if you're starting over with everything you know today, but you I didn't have this. the skills you have today. You didn't have yeah. the network that you have today in terms of like distribution, being able to just publish a video yeah. on YouTube and have thousands of people see it. Like, what would you do? I love this question. Yes. 100%. Listen, nowadays is one of the most like, accessible times we've ever lived in for anything and everything. If I had to start over, given the prompt you just gave, I would, first of all, make a mobile game. I would do active development. So make an MVP. That's minimum, minimum viable, viable product. product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Launch the MVP. Start collecting feedback immediately. Whoever you, you can get their hands on, your mom, your brother, your coworker, whoever it is. We have platforms like TikTok that you can easily reach an audience if you just learn how the, like the different ways to game the system. Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts, like these are all platforms that have millions and millions of people watching a ton of content in a short period of time. So 
that's what I would do. And in and, and fact, that's what I'm doing for Ultra Bowders. All those things I just described. I, I think that is the modern day developer. And there's a lot of money to be made, you know, if you do this as well. You know, it's just ad model. And if your game is good enough, it connects with the audience good enough, you can do in-app purchases. Yeah, awesome. So that would be your, your advice, if I can re- summarize it, is just build an MVP as quickly as possible. Get it out there. Start iterating and publicize it through short videos, the short video Correct. format that is taking over YouTube, for better or worse. Um, and, like, of course, you know, like, uh, you know, potentially programming your kids to be, like, extremely, uh, you know, um, sensitive to their physical appearance, right? Um, things like that, right? So, sure, sure. <laughs> we, we don't need to talk add, about that. Can but, I, yeah. Can I add one more caveat? Yeah. The uh, last thing I want to add to that is really important is know when to quit. Know when to quit. Okay, tell me know about Know when that. to quit. Know when sure. to quit. I'm taking notes. So if you do all these things and you see that, like, no one's really responding, no one really cares about your MVP or update three, whatever it is, you have to realize that maybe you just did not create a product that has a good market fit and move on to the next one. It's sad. Sometimes it sucks, but it all depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking to actually be a game developer that you can get awards and all these accolades and pay your bills, knowing when to quit is very important. And it is hard when we talk about like art, but the truth of the matter is nowadays, we have a completely different system. You can't, it's much harder for you to be the artist. Wait, hold on. Let me, let me rephrase that. Yeah. Nowadays, it's more expected that you're not only just the artist or the sound designer or the programmer. You're all, you're wearing all hats now, right? Once upon a time, you could go work for a company and just play that role and have someone else figure out when to quit, right? But now you wear all the hats and you have to, you know, put on your business hat and, you know, pay attention yeah, to things Yeah, so like the this. brutal suit that's within you, the, uh, the, the pointy-haired boss, right? The, uh, the, the person who has to, you know, make the cold calculated business decision. That person is the same as the creative genius who's like scrawling all over the whiteboard with all these game ideas. You have to be both if you want to succeed. Uh, if, if you want to succeed, if you want to do it as a hobby, you can do whatever you want. But yeah, I find that to be like the biggest thing that a lot of my game developer friends fail to realize is that as much as this is an art medium and like we want to use it for artistic means, what is art if no one ever engages with it, you know? Yeah. And I mean, there are probably lots of people who think, oh, maybe some like historian is going to appreciate, you know, my game the way that Van Gogh's art was only appreciated after he shot himself in the chest with a revolver and like years had passed and people just go, oh, who's this Van Gogh yeah. guy, right? Like, but that is extremely unlikely. For every Van yeah. Gogh, there's probably thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of artists who just died in obscurity and are still obscure, right? So it's a dice roll. Yeah. So, so I mean, uh, sounds like you've taken a very pragmatic approach toward game development. Um, one thing that I want to talk about is distribution. So we talked about like um, the role of, you know, TikTok, YouTube shorts, Instagram mm-hmm. reels. There's this saying that like first time founders focus on technology. Second time founders focus on distribution. How, mm. how do you distribute your game? How do mm. you get it in front of people? Obviously you, you talked about short form video, but, but like, what are the other ways that you distribute your game? And like, like, are you using app stores? Are you, um, do you have a mailing list? Are you like, how do you get a, your game out there and get people playing it? I think I've came to a realization not too long ago that all of my games moving forward are going to be on the app store. And this, this is, is Apple due... and, and Google app store. Correct. Correct. And the reason why is because it just matches so much with kind of my business model as it already is like a lot of people come to my youtube channel and they watch my videos for free and then you know a small percentage they'll donate or they'll buy merch right but the majority in whole they expect free content and this is what the app stores are predominantly operated on it's like free apps and so i found that it's just a good fit where 
if I make free videos and I, I, I'm really lucky that I have an audience that I can make content for, right? Like I have my own audience that I can show ads to. I don't have to pay anyone. Right. right. Which I'll get into that a little bit, but in a little bit. But just to wrap this up, sorry, I have so many thoughts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Far trying away, to put it all together. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm taking notes. Um, so, so, so again, so the business model I've been operating on for a long time is free videos is what people expect. So it only makes sense that like, hey, here's a free video. Also, here's a free app that you can play in the meantime while you wait for the next video, right? And the reason why I think that the app store themselves are good is because they promote apps based on their performance of people playing it, of people downloading it, etc. Versus you look at some other stores like Steam, for example, they promote apps based on how they sell. You see, so there's a bit of a disconnect on my current business model and how Steam works. I'm not saying it's impossible to make a successful game um, from your, your YouTube audience, but it just makes more sense that I have a free app that I can send my audience to and funneling traffic to my app is measured uh is is a key performance indicator for these app stores to then push it even further so it's just like extra boost if you will okay interesting so um, so essentially external traffic to an app uh will give like like google's app store or apple's app store and they're like top app leaderboard of the week and all that stuff like you can get right. a lot of additional juice out of like maybe the same number of people just because of the type of traffic that's coming to the app. And yes. if it's external, yes. that's interesting yes. to note. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. And, and the thing is that I don't even need someone to play the game more than an hour. You know, all I need is the download and then the app stores pick that up and they say, okay, there's some interest here. We're going to promote this to people who don't even know who Jabros is, you know? Yeah. And but you for say, Steam, you say more than an hour because steam, you, you can get a refund if you play it less than a certain amount of time. Right. So a lot of people refund right. it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt your flow. They can. Well, well, I mean, look, that's actually another good point as well, right? Like, I think it's eight hours if you play before eight hours and get a refund, which means that you have to create a game that has more than eight hours of content, which is not easy, you know? And if you're, you're, if you're a full-time content creator and you're trying to launch a game on Steam, you need to make a game that has more than eight hours of content so that people don't game the system and get their money back, right. you know? Again, I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm not <laughs> saying launching games on Steam is bad. I just think that launching games on an app store is just far more optimal yeah. for the business model of a content creator, uh, like a YouTube content creator. Yeah, interesting. So, uh, not to mention the accessibility as well. Yeah, accessibility. One thing I learned, one thing I learned transitioning to do, doing mobile apps is how simple it is for people to play the app. I used to do Steam games, and there would be so many different things. Oh, I need to coordinate a time. Oh, is it is it this system or that system? Oh, my PC specs aren't good enough, right? When I've been doing mobile apps, I've been doing playtesting. I say, hey, here's the app link. In three minutes, they have it downloaded ready to yeah. play. Yeah, I mean, you've even no. done some live streams where you're like, here, download this app, and like, let's play it. Mm. And like those streams are great. Like your Who's the AI yeah. game? I can't remember the exact name. Yeah. Yeah. Or you got like... Video coming soon. Yeah. So... Different, um, different ideas like that you can iterate on them so quickly, and your audience can get into the game. And once they've played one game, that like breaks a barrier where they're like, "Okay, next time he's doing a live stream, I'm going to download the game and interact right there." These yep. multiplayer yep. games, so cool. So uh, let's say hypothetically you didn't have the uh, YouTube following that you have, how would you distribute right. your game? Would you still stick mostly to the app stores? Yeah, I think. App Source is the best way to go in terms of someone. I don't know. I, I'm still thinking about like App Stores versus Steam. Yeah. Like this is a relatively new discovery for me. I'm still thinking about it. But at this moment, I feel that App Stores are, they are the future. There are limitations. You can't really create every experience with an app, but I think you can create most experiences with an app. And the reason why I would suggest someone who doesn't have an audience to use an App Store is because you have a greater probability of getting promoted with, with on the app stores. Literally the, the, the key performance indicator for steam is sales. Yeah. So if you don't have an audience already, you make a game, you put it up on steam and you don't get any sales, you're just not going to get seen. Yeah. But if you can 
if you publish an app on Google Play or the App Store or the Apple App Store and you create like a TikTok or something and the TikTok gets some traction and you get people to go download your game, that is a key performance indicator that will be looked at yeah. and you will get extra promotion. Yeah. So it, it just makes sense, you know? Yeah, okay. I think. That, that's really, that explains why a lot of the most innovative games I've seen are on mobile formats, even though a lot of hardcore gamers cringe and bristle at the notion of playing yeah. a game on their phone when they've got like you know, a $2,000 PC with like a fancy graphics card and they've got like all their ergonomic stuff set up at their desk. So moving on from distribution, I want to talk about like game design as a mm. field. And one of the things that's so interesting to me is like the games you're developing are very different from other games. Uh, mm. Like almost like genreless in a way, or like if there is a genre, it's very, you know, specific like i we we saw the rise of lots of different genres of games such as like tower defense games for example yeah or um you know like obviously real-time strategy games have been around for a long time but before video games reached a certain level of sophistication the notion of a real-time strategy game where you controlled a whole lot of different units and a whole you were like making so many decisions like that had to come from somewhere right first person shooters uh like mm -hmm. like doom had to come from somewhere and they came from the idea uh, the, from the mind of a few developers probably sketching things out on whiteboards, probably building really yeah. coarse prototypes, right? Even side scrollers, like the or original arcade games had yeah. the constraint that they couldn't scroll because it was too graphically intensive. Now you can, I mean, I want to say you can do basically anything with the computational power of like an iPhone or an Android. Like, do you think we'll ever exhaust the design space for games and interactive experiences? No, I don't think so. I so there's a game that came out not too long ago. It's um I don't remember the name of it, but it, it meshes two genres together, two relatively new genres together. And even that, I'm like, we're never gonna run out of ideas. Like there there's so many genres that you can take to this day and, and just do one plus one and get two. Like to this day, there's so much unexplored and we we are still creating new genres as the years go on, so I don't think that we will, you know. You, you, yeah, I, I can go on, but I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, and like, so how do you how did you come up with the idea of having a turn based fighting game? Because of course, there's like Pokemon. Mm. There are lots of like collectible card games and stuff mm. like that. There are lots of games that are turn based. Uh, but board games, basically anything in the tabletop world mm. is necessarily almost turn based just because otherwise you'd have people like throwing their hands all over the table and stuff. Yeah. How did you come up with this particular idea? Cause people think about, you know, Tekken, they think about street fighter. They think about games yeah. that, uh, require like frame perfect inputs and stuff like that. Like what, what inspired you to go down this, this route? Thank you for asking this question. I have immense passion for, uh, this game, this turn-based fighting game that I'm making Ultra Bowders, uh, because it, it mixes everything that I've kind of learned over the last like 15 years in the sense of design and the sense of code and sense of so many different things, graphics, etc. But the, to answer your question directly, I, I've always been a huge fan of anime. And I've played many anime games over the years, but I've never been really satisfied with the anime games that I play because you watch like Goku versus Vegeta, right? And yeah. Dragon Ball Z. And you see them doing some incredible things that you just wish you could do. But then you go play a game and they have to limit you because you're playing a game in real time with the controller with a limited amount of inputs, right? And so having the, the desire to want to like really feel like Goku, but also uh, coming off of a chess addiction that I had. Yeah. I realized that, and I, I'm still exploring this beyond Ultra Belters. I realized that, I think that some of the, the greatest experiences we have yet to experience are ditching real-time simulation and in, 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 in favor of like a, like a turn-based yeah. or a frame-by-frame -frame simulation. Yeah, and frame-by-frame, -frame, maybe you can describe verbally, like, so you're doing like a show Ryukin or something, and it's like, Frame by frame, it's like, okay, what would you like to do at this step? Like, and so you can alter yeah. like, you know, all different aspects of like the combat experience and you can kind of adapt to strategies. It, it presents like this 
multifaceted. Whereas like, okay, I threw a punch and they threw a punch and my punch has higher priority or my punch comes out in eight frames. There comes out in 10 frames. So I win. And then they, they, there's nothing they can do once that button's been pressed. And so many decisions in these, you know, real time fighting games, like fighting games, (laughs) because they're all real time, basically like they they happen at at like a, the level, like the human threshold for reaction time, I think is like a quarter of a second, right? Like if you have like, you go to the science museum and they've got the, the magnet thing and it holds the ruler and it drops it and you have to grab it. And it, it like, I tried it so many times. I could never really get below the quarter of a second threshold. Mm. The games happen faster. So you have to kind of like input and you have to come up with heuristics like, Oh, I'm going to throw this and this, and you kind of develop an intuition, but you can't actually react to what's happening. It's right. It's kind of physiologically impossible to really react. You know, you, you might be able to memorize yeah. exactly how to parry, you know, like Chun Li's special or something like that, to where right. you can parry every single hit of it or something like that, right? But you're not going to be able to uh, adapt your gameplay in real time. And it sounds like what you're building yeah. gives you the opportunity to consider all those things. And it, and it lets you step back and deliberate. Like a real time chess experience would be extremely boring watching two grandmasters sit at the table and think really hard for 15 minutes and make a move, right? Like the chess clocks are like yeah. nine hours in some games, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. But at the same time, it's incredibly engaging if you're the person who's at the chess table looking at the game, yeah. trying to decide what to do. Yeah. Also, replays. I, I was really addicted to watching chess replays. There's, uh, I think, Gotham Chess. He does, like, his YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. He has a bunch of uh, replay commentary on, like, really famous matches. And it was so enthralling to me. But I, I realized that it's not going to be enthralling to everyone. Like, you have to have an yeah. understanding of chess to some degree. And, you know, it's really plain graphics. Um, yeah, There's so many things that came together for the Ultra Bowders Project. I remember I was going to do a video a few years ago about... Um, a concept in the matrix, right? So you think about the matrix, right? right. You think what, what would it take if we had the ability to dodge bullets? Yeah. Right. And the truth of the matter is you just would have to have a much, uh, a much larger iteration of time, uh, perception. Yeah. Right. In, time in terms of like one, yeah. So like one second, you need to be able to perceive much faster. Yeah. Right. And I was gonna make this video where. You could put on a VR and you would get shot by an agent. And then I would calculate the trajectory that it's going and then just skip the time so that it puts it right in front of you. So you get to react to it. But then the, the person who shot the gun sees you dodging it. it, it so, yeah, then so they can, they can rambling, quickly but... adopt to where you are and like triangulate where they think you're going to go and shoot in that direction. We're talking about the 1999 classic the Matrix, if anybody listening to this has not seen that movie. I, I mean, it is literally my favorite movie. I'm not exaggerating. I've watched yeah, lots it's, of movies. It's my favorite. I, I think it's the most creative, interesting. Like, it holds up really well, uh, even today in 2024. Yeah. But but sorry for the, the segue. Like, and, and the plot no, is I surprisingly agree. deep. If you watch the entire trilogy, are the machines actually bad? Think about it, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but to get to I your love, point, yeah. like, the... the ab- ability to adapt and then have your opponent adapt and like there, there's also kind of like the meta gaming like conventionally people will do this so like they can recognize the strategy and they can develop heuristics to be able to make decisions again the sort of stuff that like maybe an extremely high level fighting game player already does but they do it almost intuitively after thousands of hours mm-hmm. of practice what if you right. just picking up this game could start to have that that kind of push and pull that interplay that's the exact point of Ultra Bowders is you no longer need that thousand hours. Like here, we're going to give it to you step by step. So you, you can, you can take all the time that you need to evaluate the game state. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It sounds so cool, man. And, uh, you mentioned anime. I, I'm just going to jump to that, man. Like what inspired you a game developer to create anime to uh, Japanese animation style, uh, you know, cartoons <laughs> essentially. Uh, that's a great question. I, I personally think that a lot of the best stories come from anime. Um, I can't, like, I think a lot of the stories that have resonated with me to this day are, like, all anime stories from yeah. Cowboy Bebop to to Big O to Dragon Ball. Like, they're all anime stories. And I came to a point where I wanted to tell my own story. 
and I thought, what better medium than to create a create an anime? It's still in in progress. It's it's in manga form at the moment, but we'll we'll get to it eventually. Awesome. Correct. You were yeah. hiring to develop the art. You're actually an artist, oh, nice. and I took this the tofu car that nice. is like the star nice. of the uh, of the show. And I just was like, hey, can you can you do something similar about me holding my base, playing like kind of like leaning against the car? So that's the cover mm. of the uh, the uh, Learn to Code RPG soundtrack thing. But um, nice, but, nice. But I've worked with artists, and they're not that expensive. At least the ones like it, it's amazing. Like uh, you you can find artists who really take pride in their craft you can support them in their craft and you can get them to uh essentially develop art based on your prompt if you will like you've been doing that right you've been working with artists correct correct and it's been quite the journey i um you know before i did any of this i was like yeah usually i just go and tell someone who i think is talented to make some art and they do it but (laughs) yeah you know, they're individuals, they're also entrepreneurs, you know, they have their own schedules and timelines and projects and dreams and aspirations. And, you know, some are better than others, unfortunately, but I am lucky to have found a good group of artists that I am able to work really well with. And they do really talented work and you know, learn a lot. Yeah. So you, so you write and you come up with the characters and kind of like figure out what's correct, what you want to relay to, to the reader or eventually the yeah. viewer, and then they help you execute on that through their skills. Correct, correct. Yeah. I do all the writing, character design, all that stuff. And uh, there's a bit of a compromise, you know, when you when you bring anyone on any project, right? Like they have their own fair share of say into the content just by the nature of their yeah. art style and the way they interpret things. But, how, you know, it's part of the collaborative process, so I, I don't mind it. So how would you, how would you compare working with human artists to working with, you know, frameworks that you're developing games on and stuff. Cause as a, as an indie dev, you're kind of like doing everything soup to nuts, lock, stock and barrel, right? Like you're, you're, you're kind of doing, I don't know if you actually develop your own assets, but like maybe you could talk about like just how many different hats you wear when you're building a game versus, you know, collaborating with humans for art. It's, it's a lesson that I'm learning uh, how to do less, wear less of the hats. Yeah. Um, once upon a time, I, I had this belief that you are not a real creative if you didn't do the whole thing yourself. Once upon a time, I believe that, but I have, I think, actually, thanks to the manga project and working with artists because I had no other option to because I can't draw. It has taught me a lot of. It has showed me like the value of working with people. And so Ultra Bout is actually, it has, I have a 3D modeler. Shouts to my boy Colossal Cake. He's doing the 3D models on that. They look beautiful. Far better than anything I could ever do. And uh, I, sorry, I forget the question you said. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Like what hats would you wear as a game dev versus now? You're just writing and kind of directing, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Back then, uh, it's everything. Design, it's code, it's art, it's sound, it's music, it's it's writing, it's, it's everything. You know, character design, it's everything and i and you know what's interesting is that i think that's part of the reason why scope is so difficult is because like you have to do everything and and now that i've relinquished the art to an artist colossal cake for ultra bouters that's just one less thing that i have to worry about right so now i can i have this i have this uh like this this group of things that is like a little less heavy with the art removed that I can put yeah. more time into and help me scope things correctly. Awesome. Well, I want to talk a little bit about AI. That's like the thing that everybody talks about now. Uh, there have been some really impressive advancements in AI. Recently we saw like Sora, which is this uh, um, video creation tool mm-hmm. put out by OpenAI. Um, and of course we've got like image creation tools uh, and we've got text creation tools. You've used AI in a, a lot of your recent projects. Um, let's talk a little bit about your relationship with AI and mm-hmm. how you got, how you like looked at it. Like this is ready for me to actually use it, right? Because mm-hmm. it's been around forever. You know, lots of people have developed things with AI over the past few years. I mean, you could argue that like game AI is as old as games themselves because yeah. otherwise there wouldn't be much of a game if the Pac-Man ghost just sat there, right? Like, yeah, yeah, but what inspired you to pick up 
AI and what are some of the things you've been building with it? Mm -hmm. What inspired me to pick up AI? Once again, this is a callback to the beginning of the podcast. Um, I used to watch my mom play Duck Kong Country on the Super Nintendo when I was young. And again, she had a controller and she was controlling Donkey Kong, but there were agents that I, I just was like, who's controlling the agents? Who 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 is controlling the, the enemies, the baddies? And that like I think started my fascination with AI and wanting to learn more. Um so I get to Game Maker and I'm making a bunch of games and I'm learning how to do AI for the first time. And once I learned how to do it well, man, I made so many games that like you couldn't even play. Like I just sat and watched it. I had this one game, a quick side note, that I made that was like anime shonen style, a bunch of fighters, they're in like an arena, and I would just put it on and watch it as I fall asleep. Anyways. That's cool. I I eventually come across um Carl Sims um Evolution Simulator mm -hmm. uh demo thing, and that really changed like my whole concept of what AI could be with their generative algorithm they was demonstrating. Obviously I had no idea how to do it at the time. But that stuck in my brain for many, 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 many years until finally I found Unity. And there's all these announcements about TensorFlow, you know, which is a uh, machine learning Google's, library. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, now all of a sudden, all these resources are available where I can learn back propagation and the various calculus things that I need. And uh, I spend eight months to learn all that stuff. And then I make, I basically try and make what Carl Sims made in his 1990. One demo, I think it is, um, on YouTube, and it worked. It blew up, and I, I've always had a fascination for AI. Awesome. I'll track down that Carl Sims demo and put it in the show notes for anybody who wants to watch it. Let's talk about some of the things you've built with it. Like, I, I can't not talk about the amazing Shark Tank, Shark Tank episode generator. Uh, uh -huh. This, I was laughing, like, like practically rolling on the floor watching the video where you demoed some of it. And it's just the, the show Shark Tank is so absurd for anybody who knows anything about business, like even admi me administering a charity. Like the show is so absurd and ridiculous and it's not how real people invest. The business advice, like uh, <laughs> there might no. be some useful advice in there, but it's, it's hyper real reality TV, right? Yeah. So now imagine people are coming in with straight faces, <laughs> pitching things like underwear, <laughs> underwater shops for fish <laughs> to shop at. Uh, I'm trying to remember some of the other ones, but the, uh, baby's first handgun, you know, baby's totally first handgun. absurd, but they're coming in and they're silent. They're doing their silent fire alarm. Yeah. Silent fire alarm. Like, isn't it annoying <laughs> when a fire alarm goes off? Silent fire alarm, you know, like pitching it as a product and having like the, you know, the cast of uh, the sharks, I guess is what they're called. Like reacting mm -hmm. to it. Like, Oh, I'm out. You know, yeah. <laughs> the cigarette that has, 10x the nicotine or something like that yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah like you, you don't have to smoke as much because you get 10x <laughs> nicotine easier on the lungs right i mean and then uh i mean it sounds like something that would have been pitched at like the height of the 80s or something like that like but <laughs> these are really amazing scripts and you've even kind of figured out like some rigging so that you can have like it a visual element to it like the the shark mm -hmm. sitting back in their chair like their lips are moving as they talk and and the voices like GPT has probably read the transcripts of every single Shark Tank episode ever, so it can kind of almost nail the manner in which the sharks would react to a given proposal if they were entertaining as a serious proposal, which none of these are. Yeah. Maybe you can talk about developing that and like what inspired you to develop that. Yeah, I um I love Shark Tank. It's a very entertaining show, incredibly entertaining. But you know, kind of like what I touched on in the video, the best episodes of Shark Tank are the bad ideas. This is always the most entertaining. And it just came to me one day. I was like, well, I want more Shark Tank episodes of bad ideas. And I think we can make this happen with AI. I think someone had asked me when I was talking to them about it, like, what if someone pitched, uh, it was some crazy idea. And I was like, that would be so funny. And I think the initial idea was to just do it myself. And I was like, no, 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 we can make an AI algorithm to do this for us. And so I started to develop it. And funny enough, I was actually going to stop at the 3D rendering, but I remember showing it to someone. They're like, oh, yeah, this is cool. And I was like, no, what do you mean this is cool? This is this is amazing. And what I, what I had figured out is that the idea itself was cool, but the presentation was terrible. In, in the video, there's like a 3D model of the sharks, and it's like yeah. whatever presentation. And so that's when I learned that like I need to take it further. 
And so I got a bunch of different libraries to make them like the face driving and whatnot. And then I showed that to the same person. Like, oh, I love it. This is amazing. I want to see more. Right. So rapidly iterating, lesson on, on essentially, uh, as you got feedback and just thinking like, hey, I could use AI for this. I'm sure a lot of developers are kind of like working on things and they're like, wait a second. I need to generate a whole lot of scripts and I don't want to, if I write them myself, they probably won't be as funny as what GPT creates anyway. Yeah. Um, Cause again, it's read everything. It's read every Reddit post It's read every yeah. book in the library of Congress. Like it has the context to be able to come up with stuff. And it's very useful in that <clears> regard. So maybe we could talk a little bit about um, AI and what you think it's likely to disrupt. You did a recent kind of tier list of jobs you think are likely to be disrupted. <laughs> By AI, yeah, and uh, very controversial. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's controversial because I think a lot of people greatly overestimate the capability of AI, and they see like this big step change, and they think that like, oh, the next big step change is just around the corner, and then next thing you know, we're in like, you know, lawnmower man or something. I don't know, but, but yeah. maybe you could talk about like um, your tier list and like where you put different jobs, and then what proved to be the most controversial. All of it. All of it's controversial, apparently. Um, yeah, I, I don't remember specifically a lot of them, to yeah. be honest. But I, I do know that I got a comment like an hour ago of someone talking about how delusional I am, thinking that factory workers won't be replaced. And so I, I replied to them and say, okay, just to make sure I understand what you're saying. You're saying that the 200,000 factory workers who work on the iPhone are going to be replaced within 5, 10 years? And then his reply was like, well, I think about 180,000 of them are going to be replaced in the five, 10 years. I'm just like, how did we get here? Yeah. How did we get here? That is an absurd claim. Five, 10 years, 180,000 factory workers will be replaced to make an iPhone? Like, that, that is so absurd. Yeah. That is so absurd. Like, when we get into, like, the actual economics of it, it's like, how much does that cost? I was lucky enough. I did a tour uh, of one of Amazon's robot facilities. And... Amazon, I think they have like a $1.6 trillion market cap or something like that. And they were showing us ro robots that were in beta, you know, and this person's talking about we'll replace 180. It's just, it's just crazy to me. I don't know. I don't, I, I, I have an idea how we got here. Sci-fi is really appealing. And, you know, uh, oftentimes we don't really think too deeply about like the economics and actual effects of these things, but you know, yeah, it is what it is, I guess. So do you think people greatly overestimate like like the, the most common thing I hear, the most common question I get an email about it, people who've listened to more than one episode of the Free Cocaine uh, podcast will no doubt be like, oh, Quincy's going to talk about it again. But I am because it's important. People write me every mm. single day. Hey, should I still learn to code or is my job going to com be completely automated? And uh, yeah, wh what would you say to, to some whippersnapper who's like, Jabril, should I still learn game dev or is game dev just going to be automated in five years? Um... So I, I do think that there is a probability that it will be automated at some point. I think five, 10 years is too short of a time scale. Um, I can get into why, but yeah. before I do that, and before I do that, I, I, again, I always like to like ground these things in economics, right? If I am going to go make the next Facebook or what do they call it? Meta or whatever they call it. And I want to hire an AI to do my, to be my full-time programmer, right? The real question is how much does that cost in API keys? Like how much does it cost? Right now, if I want a full team of AI programmers, how much does that cost? Like these are real questions that we need to ask. Yeah. Right. And then furthermore, right. We can keep going. If an AI um, programmer makes a mistake, like a fundamental foundational mistake within the code and doesn't, report it who do we blame you know like there's so many questions that we need to explore that i think that we're so far away especially someone that's been working with these tools uh on a daily basis building actual products with it there's so many foundational errors not saying it can't get better but i i, I think that there's an element of language that we as humans don't even understand and to see the um, to see that understanding uh, being implemented in these AI language models within the next five ten years when we don't even understand it 
I think is a little absurd. Yeah. But. Yeah. And what I think are the things that you've been most impressed by with tools like GPT-4 that you're like, oh, this is genuinely useful and this saved me a whole lot of time. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I think GPT, ChatGPT is like one of the most foundational, like amazing products of the last 30 years. I think it's amazing. However, I just always like to push back on like, you guys need to chill. Like it's, it's, it's not going to do all that the things that you think it's going to do, at least not right now. Um, but in terms of like what I use it for, I use it for virtually everything, man. If I'm making a video, I go ask it for some advice. Uh, if I am working on a game feature, I'll ask it for advice or even code. Uh, if I'm having problems with my relationship, I'll ask for advice. If there's some news article, I'll say, hey, can you summarize this for me? Like I use it for almost everything, to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah, and it improves your productivity, your personal productivity. And I think that's one of the things you struck at in the, the video is it's going to improve the productivity of lawyers, but it's not going to replace lawyers. No. Heaven forbid we have, you know, I mean, I can only imagine like all the, you know, lawsuits and all, all the economic waste that would come from delegating that when you could just hire a lawyer who, yes, they're expensive, but these are important decisions, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So very important. Decisions. Yeah. And, and I would say like, you know, a doctor, a lawyer, like, I don't think that those jobs are like, and I think software engineer is also in that category because software engineer makes a mistake and a plane falls out of the sky, you know, like yeah. you're going to want actual people working on some of those things. I guess the, the main question I have for you is are the fields not complete replacement, which is what your video was about, but do you think that an individual developer could become so productive by leveraging all these tools that you just need fewer developers? Yeah, I think that's definitely possible. And I, I would be surprised if it's not already happening, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but I mean, but I, the question I always have is like, what is that? What is that saying? And what are you trying to say? Not you personally, coincidentally, yeah. but like someone who make, puts forward this argument. Are you saying that we should stop AI technology because it makes people more productive? Like that's not in the human spirit. You know, we for a millennia have been creating tools to further our production. Right. Um. I personally find arguments like that, when we talk about displacement, right, instead of replacement, I find that to be very telling on, like, the individual, you know. Learn these tools, man. They're not that difficult, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, in in my opinion, tools are getting easier to learn every day. Like, it's getting easier and easier yeah. to learn how to code, for example, to learn how to yeah. be a database administrator, to learn how to do DevOps. Um, yeah, the tools are improving. So I just want to wrap up with a few quick questions uh, that I'm excited to ask you. Are you like inspired by like Hong Kong Kung Fu dubbing or something? Why is it so many of your videos? Uh -huh. You're like, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I love that. It's so funny. And uh, I, I haven't seen any other creators do that. Is that common? Am I just missing out on like a genre of, you know, videos or is that distinctly you? <laughs> Um, I don't think I've came across any other creators that do that. So just to describe um, it like it, verbally for, for people that aren't watching the video, like when you watch a Jabril video, he'll be like eating pizza and like his voice sounds totally clear. It doesn't sound like he's eating pizza, but he's obviously eating pizza and like doing these very exaggerated movements and stuff. It's so charming. Uh, <laughs> and it, it, it's so it, there's like this weird kind of disconnect where like I'm watching Jabril, but I'm not <laughs> You know, I'm listening to a different Jabril, like in a different time. Why doesn't he sync it up? It it also seems like a huge time save because you can just dis gesticulate and do whatever, and then you can have that almost as like B roll from when you're actually recording your film, your videos, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. So the the inspiration for it before I used to make my videos uh, like reading scripts, mm -hmm. like I would deadpan just read a script, but it took so much time. It took a lot of time retaking and. I don't say a word properly. And one day I was watching a video. It was like some kid. He was doing like a commentary with gameplay footage on screen. I was like, this is so brain dead simple. Why can't I do this? And I was like, wait, I can do this, you know, except for I'm just a little more egotistical. I need my face on screen. Yeah. So I just use my face at, in lieu of the gameplay footage. Um, but I don't do that anymore. Unfortunately, it, it, it got to a point where it was like a highlight for a lot of people to the point where like I'm overthinking so many takes and it ended up taking a lot more time than it yeah. used to. So I kind of 
I found a new way that's faster to make videos. Yeah. Yep. I get comments every single what's day. Your, that what's your new faster way just out of curiosity? Yeah, so my, my latest way is I will go on uh, green screen and just basically just rift. Yeah, just, just start going, basically? Yeah, just, just rift. I'll have, like, bullet points on what I want to touch on, but I'll just rift in front of the green screen. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll, I'll film clips here and there throughout the process, uh, just doing, like, commentary that I can play if need be. Yeah, that's cool. So um, at the end of your free cocaine course, uh, the course that you published uh, on math or on uh, computer science, like basically yeah. programming 101, you say, remember to always feed your curiosity. You say that's True. the final most important rule. Can you True. explain what you mean by feed your curiosity and why it's so important? Yeah. That used to be my mantra. I used to always say it at the end of the videos. I have it at the end of my description still, but yeah, so the, the whole concept behind that is I, I think it was really important. It was a lesson that I learned pretty young that there there's so many like things that we can do in a, in a lifetime, but if you don't, if you don't follow the things that make you curious, if you don't feed that curiosity, you, you will, you'll never end up where you need or you deserve to be. And it was just something that I like to say, just to remind people that like, yeah, you might get curious about code. You might get curious about whatever it is, graphics or sports or whatever it is. Take that action. Feed that curiosity. Find out if you actually like it or not. Because you never know where it might lead you. You know, I would not be here today if it was for me feeding my insatiable curiosity. <laughs> Yeah, you might be working at Joanne's Fabric Store. <laughs> hey, I could be working at Joanne's Fabric Store. Yeah. It's a good callback. Yeah. So yeah. what are you focused on now? Obviously, uh, you've got uh, Hacksware. Can you talk about that real quick? And also, like, your Hacks, like, kind of, like, logo that's on your beanie here. Yeah, very oh, yeah. distinctive, uh, kind of, like, hand-drawn, almost, like, street art style. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Hex is the, it's very boring, but it's just like the company that I use for legal stuff. Um, but Hexware is the IP that I've been building out. Um, I have a really, really good story that I cannot wait to tell. I wish I can do it faster. If I yeah. could, I would. Um, but Hexware is the IP. And then Hex is just like the business that I do merch. And um, anytime I show up, I don't know. I, I haven't really thought too much about Hex, but. It's it's the business yeah. and then merch. So the hacksware is it's a it's like a large like intellectual property. You say IP like almost like a franchise or like a universe of Correct. characters and stories. Like you would think of like the Star Wars universe or something like that. So this yes. is a big project. It's like a multi year endeavor. It's huge. It's it's humongous. It's humongous. I've been writing it since 2019. Wow. It's humongous. I wish I can get content out faster, but is there like things anything you could say to describe it beyond just like the name and like those posters behind you? Like, what is it about? Sure, sure. So it's a it's a galaxy um, in which uh, it's based on shonen um, battles. Yeah, so, so that's shonen just like, being uh, like the like Shao and Hien, uh, like the the young yeah. kids basically, or like young years, small years. I think is literally how it translates. And it's a style of manga. Like if you ever heard of like Shonen Jump or some of those uh, manga that you can get from Japan that often are translated into English. Uh, it, it's basically like a style of anime that's all about like mostly young men like kind of overcoming their fear and like leveling themselves up <laughs> is the best mm, way I could describe yeah. it. Is that a good description though? Yeah, I think it's a fair enough description. I think the description I like to use nowadays is it's uh, story progression through fighting. Mm -hmm. That's that's like the best kind way of fighting, I like to explain like, it. Like I, challenges like if you watch like. Uh, for example, uh, Demon Slayer, like it's like yeah. he goes from fighting, like having to like slice the boulder in half to like finding progressively right. higher level demons. Um, yeah. and, and that, yep. that kind of, uh, yeah, but go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So, so that, that, that's what has inspired me. I love Shonen so much and that is the, that that's at the center of, of what the IP is, but there are so many really good stories that like I've experienced that I've taken from other people, um, I, I plan to bring on some other writers to tell some of their stories as well. 
and just it's a galaxy in which like all of this uh, is contained in. And the first story that I'm starting with, it's Hexware Paragon. It's that's the manga. And it's about a young man, Jinzo, or two young men, Jinzo and Swiss, who are from a little desolate planet. And they have this dream to become a great fighter. Very cliche, I understand. But it's about the journey that they take. That is the real interesting part. Um, to be and so they're up against... The, the place that they live doesn't have a lot of resources, so they don't have access to, like, you know, work a job and, and whatnot. So they resort to crime to make their money. They're up against law enforcement. They're up against um, uh, the generational um, authority that came before them. Uh, they're up against themselves. And they have to figure out how do they overcome this situation. And that is the linchpin for the Hex IP. But I, I have so many stories that I've written, and I honestly can't wait to tell. And just I got to figure out the best way to get those story out. Yeah. And so you're thinking it's going to be a manga and then ultimately like an anime? Or are you going to make an interactive experience? I'm still trying to figure it out. I, I started with the first thing I made was a um, audio book. Just because it was simple and easy to get it up and running. But like people don't really care about audio books is what I learned. And so I did a manga. But now the manga is taking a while. So I'm thinking about doing like an app type thing. Yeah. Like a, maybe a visual but, novel or something. That's the medium we chose. I mean, it's not as exciting, I think, but maybe like a voiced visual novel could be like a good compromise where you could just get still images instead of having like animation. Right. You're doing so many frames it like exponentially balloons in cost probably, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we haven't done any animation yet. We still have the manga. But yeah, yeah. So it, there's a lot of a lot of really good stories that I'm really excited to tell. Yeah. Um, we also have a video game that is being released in this IP as well. Hexware Enforcer Games. Hexware Enforcer. Um, Very cool. Yeah. And uh, so would you say that's like your like long run, like your long term vision, like how like the next five, ten years, is that a huge part of your professional life? Uh, I hope so. I hope so. I think if I'm looking long term, I just really want to tell this story and just have this story out here. I, I one of my favorite stories I'm sorry, one of my favorite IPs of all time is X Men. And it didn't become my favorite IP until I learned about its inspiration. It was Stanley's commentary on civil rights. Mm -hmm. And when I learned that, it, overnight, the value of X-Men changed for me. And that is just the power of storytelling, I believe. And so, like, that, that, that's what I want to do is I just want to tell a really good story that is fun, entertaining, but also, like, really says something, you know? Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm a huge X-Men fan. Uh, I'm actually watching the animated series with my kids, uh, the, the old one. Of Didn't they reboot it? X-Men is not a reboot. It's a continuation. They just pick up where they left off. Really? Yeah. It's called X-Men 97. And it literally takes like the last episode and just goes right into, yeah, like it never ended. Oh, I never knew that. So I don't, I oh, just learned about this from Leon Noel, 100 devs founder a few days ago, like literally last, wow. last week is when I learned about it. So, uh, yeah, that, that interview is probably live by the time anybody's listening to this. But we do talk a lot about X-Men. He's a big X-Men fan, too. He said he literally yeah, cried right. when he saw the trailer for the new one. Yeah, he was that oh, wow. excited about yeah, it. Yeah, it's so, a real fan. Yeah, awesome, man. Nice. Well, it's been such an, a privilege taking nearly two hours of your time hanging out yeah. with you, Jabril. I'm going to add links to a lot of your different projects um, in the show notes. Everyone, be sure to check these out. Be sure to follow Jabril's YouTube channel. Check out some of his back catalog of hilarious videos. Check out his new t AI tool, toy, your your yeah. friend, your AI friend that you like physically bring around with you. And that was amazing. I bought. Yeah. Yeah, check that out. And um, I just really appreciate you making time to join us, man. Thank you for having me. I, I truly do appreciate it. And thanks for everything you guys are doing for the community, honestly. Yeah. Well, everybody, until next week, happy coding.